Yeah. Okay, as I said, we're a slide list, but um, um, uh, you won't have to imagine some of these things. Um, the talk is called Romanticism and Situated Creativity. A passage in a letter traditionally attributed to Mozart runs like this. When I am, as it were, completely myself, entirely alone, and of good cheer, say, traveling in a carriage, or walking after a good meal, or during the night when I cannot sleep, it is on such occasions that my ideas flow best and most abundantly. All of this spars my soul, and provided I am not disturbed, my subject enlarges itself, becomes methodized and defined, and the whole, though it be long, enlarges itself. It stands almost complete and finished in my mind, so that I can survey it like a fine picture, or a beautiful statue, at a glance. All this inventing, this producing, takes place in a pleasing, lively dream. But committing to paper is done quickly enough, for everything is, as I said before, already finished. And it really differs on paper from what it was in my imagination." End quote. Now the Mozart letter paints a vivid picture of what I call the romantic conception of creativity. Maggie briefly alluded to romantic viewpoints. The, the picture is this. The creative artist stands alone. His creativity is an exercise of imagination. The creative process is complete in his head and it does not depend on any external factors for its occurrence. The externalizing of the result of the creative process is a non-creative act of mere fabrication or skill. Now, that romantic conception of the creative process, so we, we may or may not have a slide there shortly, that romantic conception of the creative process as occurring entirely in the head and independent of external conditions was enormously influential on later writers. The philosopher Conworth, for instance, made it central to his view of art. On the standard interpretation of his view, Conworth holds that the work of art is an imaginary object, something that can occur only in the head. Its creation for Conworth is an act of expressive imagination. And its externalization in physical form is a matter of mere fabrication rather than creation. This is what Collingwood says. The actual making of the tune is something that goes on in his, that is, the composer's head. Right, so, go back here. So, there's the uh, Mozart quote, which I read out. And here's a Collingwood. The actual making of the tune is something that goes on in his, the composer's head, and nowhere else. The making of a tune is an instance of imaginative creation. The same applies to the making of a poem, or a picture, or to any other work of art. Well, one need not adopt Collingwood's ontological view that the work of art is an imaginary entity to endorse the romantic conception of creativity. It's sufficient to hope that the creative process happens solely in the head and independently of any external support. Vincent Thomas, another philosopher, for instance, acknowledges the materiality of artworks such as sculptures, but holds that the creative process consists in the having of the idea of them, and that the externalization of that idea is a matter of non-creative work. But if he, the artist, that is, already had the idea in mind, all that would remain to be done is to objectify the idea in paint or in stone. And this would be a matter of skill or work. By the time they, as the sculptors, had the idea, the creative act, which in this case is the production of the idea, is finished. The creative bit is the having of the idea in your head. The rest is really non-creative external fabrication. Now that thought, I think, underlies the practice of some conceptual artists who actually um, illustrate this romantic conception of creativity. They hope that the production of the artistic idea that's creative is the sole creative act, and its physical realization is a non-creative task 
It can be left to other people. So, for instance, I think Solar Witch wall drawings uh, were created by him as designs, and his creative process terminated in those designs. Their physical realization in multiple venues across the world was left to his creative assistants. The creative bit was having the idea which was done entirely in the head. Now, though it has considerable grip on our culture, the romantic conception stands in striking tension with what are known as situated views of cognition, which in the last couple of decades have risen to prominence in both philosophy and cognitive science. Situated views comprise a diverse group of theories that hold that cognition, including creative cognition, is fundamentally dependent on and shaped by external conditions, that is, conditions outside the brain. There are different versions of the view. The extended mind version holds that, quote, the boundaries of cognition extend beyond the boundaries of individual organisms. A cognitive process on this view sometimes includes elements outside the brain and even the body, so that external factors such as intermediate products, including sketches and models, that artists typically produce in the course of making their artworks constitute, under certain conditions, genuine parts of the cognitive process involved. You might literally go and expand out beyond the brain and body to the world. A different kind of situated view, the embedded view, holds that though cognitive processes occur solely in the brain, they are causally dependent and often necessarily coarsely dependent on external factors, such as those intermediate artistic products just mentioned. So that view maintains that, again, quote from an overview of the field, cognitive activity routinely exploits structure in the natural and social environment. Now, both kinds of situated views stand in stark opposition to the romantic conception of creativity since they maintain that the creative process in this cognitive dimension is not independent of external factors in the way that the romantic conception thinks it is. Now, the version of situated cognition that I think is correct, the embedded view, hopes to expand on that brief characterization I've just given, that, this is M up there, cognitive activity routinely exploits and is shaped by structures in the natural, cultural, and social environment, and cognizing agents routinely create such structures in order to enable or enhance cognition. Now, the import of those claims, well, I think, will become clear as I continue illustrating them. I'm now going to give three kinds of evidence, well, which I think show the inadequacy of romantic deceptive creativity, and then illustrate how creative production depends on external factors. First is to do with imagination. <coughs> the Mozart letters identify as imagination as a prime or perhaps sole creative faculty and holds that the creative work is generated by and stands complete in imagination. Such a view requires imagination to have the capacity to produce and retain in memory works of extraordinary complexity. But there's reason to doubt whether this is attainable for even people with vivid imaginations. A classic psychological study by Deborah Chambers and Daniel Reisberg examined the ability of participants to discover the ambiguity in ambiguous figures, primarily the duck rabbit figure. They somehow managed to find people that hadn't seen the duck rabbit figure before. Clearly, they could have been philosophers. So, uh, aggregating across all of their experiments, a total of 35 subjects who were unacquainted with the duck rabbit uh, drawing uh, were presented with a drawing of it for five seconds, so briefly up on the screen. They were asked to form a mental image of it and then prompted to discover the alternative explanation from their mental image. None of them were able to do so. They were then asked to draw the figure from their mental images, and then in all 35 cases, they then were able to identify the other aspect of the figure that they previously alluded to. Actually, drawing it from their own mental images allowed them to see an ambiguity they couldn't do by merely imagining it. Now, many of these participants in the experiment were actually high-quality 
visualizers. And several were students trained to practice artists or architects. So clearly the problem was a deficit in visual imagination as such that they were more in visually imagining things. Now, what this experiment shows is the limits of imagining. And the plausible source of this is in the top-down processing of visual imagery. That is in visual imagery being structurally constrained. You're imagining it as a duck or as a rabbit in your mind. However, what's not been generally remarked is that though the outline drawing of the duck rabbit is perceived, so people discuss it talk about perception, when we view it in respect of being a duck or a rabbit, we of course see it as a duck or see it as a rabbit, and that's an exercise of seeing as, which is a form of imagination. So imagining it seems to be to operate its full capacity sometimes requires external props. Without them, you cannot discover the ambiguity in these kinds of figures. For imagining to be fully effective, it requires props for make-believe, to use Kendall Walton's phrase. So this imagination is dependent for its operation on features of the external world in some complex cases. But notice precisely those kind of complex cases of imagining that are likely to figure in artistic creation. Since they generate features that support multiple rich interpretations and also metaphorical descriptions and properties that are artworks. Now, the need for external props is part of the explanation for why artists sketch before creating final works. Externalizing allows them to see different aspects of what they're doing. And also of why they frequently alter works during the course of making them. But that's not the only explanation for artistic sketching. Complex entities, whether artworks or scientific theories, have multiple parts, and their development typically occurs over extended periods of time. The kind of memory, working memory, needed to hold items in mind while manipulating them is surprisingly limited in its capacity. It comes in different sorts, but one sort is um, visual working memory, uh, verbal working memory. So people can, for instance, only remember as many unrelated words as they can recite to themselves in two seconds, which is normally about um, uh, between five and nine unrelated words. So people standardly adopt the strategy of offloading information to the environment by physically recording or embodying it when they're engaged in cognitively demanding tasks. This strategy ranges from simple activities like counting on your fingers or writing down your password when a website asks for only some uh, uh, digits from it. So it's mildly embarrassing when you do this. Um, but it's actually not something that the more, only the more cognitively challenged of us actually do. And the simple proof of that is mental arithmetic. You can, I'm sure, calculate two times seven in your head but how about the other figure, other numbers? Um, can you do 21 by 27 in your head? 3, 9, 8 by 5, 2, 2. 8, 9, 7, 3 by 6, 3, 8, 2. Those multiplication sums. As the number of digits increase, you will have to reach for a piece of paper, write down the digits, and use a partial products algorithm to perform the multiplication. But uh, i single numbers and carry the, um, the numbers across the next column. Information offloading simplifies the cognitive process by substituting written digits for ones held in memory, so partly replacing memory processes with perceptual ones. Since creative products are often complex and require extended developments, limited limits to working memory are the second reason why creators must depend on a structurally external environment in order to create their products. But this is a third factor, at least probably others as well. The process of incubation in creative thought, it seems, offers sucker to the romantic conception. For instance, someone may work on some task, both to achieve the hoped for result, abandon conscious effort, and then the solution appears in a moment of sudden illumination. Incubation is the unconscious or perhaps peripheral conscious process that terminates in and explains the illumination as a standard view by what goes on. 
Incubation thus appears to constitute a purely inner moment of the creative process. The poet A.E. Hassan described his creation of his poetry thus. Having drunk a pint of beer at luncheon, sounds great, I would go after a walk of two or three hours. As I went along, thinking of nothing in particular, only looking at things around me and following the progress of the seasons, they would flow into my mind with sudden and unaccountable emotion. Sometimes a line or two of verse, sometimes a whole stanza at once, accompanied, not preceded, by a vague notion of a poem which they were destined to form part of. I hear things just coming from your unconsciousness. But if doubtful whether incubation is always independent of environmental stimuli, the way the pure incubation theory uh, would hold, uh, Norman Meyer, in a seminal experiment, gave 61 participants the task of trying to tie together two cords, one hanging from the center of the room, the other hanging close to a wall. The problem was that the cords were sufficiently far apart that you could not hold one and take it over to the other to tie them together. The room contained various objects, such as chairs, extension cords, and pliers. And Maya asked participants to keep on coming up with solutions until they found the one he was looking for, the least obvious one. That is, tie the pliers to the center cord, swing the cord, grab it, and when it actually comes to the next to the other cord, tie the two together. In other words, use the pliers to create effectively a factory pendulum with the center cord. Now, the 61 participants in that experiment some found the solution without being given a hint. Others failed to find it at all. But some found it only after being given a hint without it being signaled as a hint by Maya. So what Maya did, he walked past the center cord and accidentally brushed it. Of the 23 people who then got the idea, only seven thought that they got it from the brushing. The other 16 claimed that the idea had come to them on its own running to my mind, I don't know why, so a creative insight. Thus the apparently purely inner process of incubation in these cases depended on some outer factors. But people often confabulated in the self-attribution era, hoping that they themselves had come up with the idea. So they misidentified the source of inspiration in these cases. Now in a more recent study, Colleen Seifert um, found no evidence for incubation effects at all, pure incubation effects. Rather, when people come up with a came up with a solution to a problem she had set them that had previously stumped them, it was because they had been exposed to the solution in the interim period without its relevance being signaled to them. This process, called opportunistic assimilation, is an instance of the prepared mind perspective on creativity. The view that if people have struggled and failed to find a solution to some problem, they are later more likely to notice features of the environment that help them to solve that problem, even if they don't realize that the environment is the source <coughs> of the idea. Indeed, Hausmann's process of poetic composition, if you think about it, given the concern of his poetry with nature and his emotional reaction to it, reaction to it is more likely to be a case of opportunistic assimilation than a pro pure process of inner incubation. Now this is not to claim that every instance of incubation is like this. Some instances, like for instance, mathematicians Henri Poincaré's sudden revelation, revelations of complex mathematical ideas on walks, are unlikely to conform to this model, since the environment could not present this kind of complex information. Seems. But recall that the embedded claim is only about what is routinely the case, rather than invariably so. And the routine engagement of external factors puts pressure on the romantic view of incubation as a purely internal process. So I've just given you briefly three kinds of evidence involving imagination, working memory, and incubation against the romantic perception of the creative process as an entirely inner one that's independent of external factors. Now, if the situated view that features of the environment claim an inner limitable 
or typical cause of role in the creative process is correct, what are the implications of that view going, helping us to enhance creativity? Well, as stated in the uh, embedded views I brought it and there, cognition, including creative cognition, exploits aspects of the environment. And moreover, agents often deliberately structure the environment so as to enable or to enhance cognition, which includes creative cognition. This structuring of the environment is known as scaffolding or niche construction when it involves multiple and interdependent access structure. An example of exploring environmental features that have not been scaffolded by the artist is to be found in the suggestion of Leonardo's in his writings on painting. This is what he says. He proposes a new aid to contemplation, of great utility in arousing the mind to various inventions. If you look at any walls soiled with a variety of stains or stones with variegated patterns, when you have to invent some location, you will there be able to see a resemblance to various landscapes, graced with mountains, rivers, rocks, trees, plains, great valleys and hills in many combinations. <coughs> so what Leonardo is saying is attention to certain features of the external world can enhance what he calls invention, creativity in our terms, by exploiting the capacity for seeing in a type of imagination. That's a deliberately structured world that way, but exploiting the resource that was there. Now, creative cognition, as I so also said, often depends on scaffolding. As I noted earlier, artists' preparatory works, such as sketches and studies, are instruments for scaffolding cognition and imagination in particular and working memory. These works are not mere records of already completed acts of imagination but are rather a means of finding out whether an idea works or not, which would not always be apparent from merely imagining it. <coughs> Frank Geary, one of the most strikingly innovative architects of the last 40 years, sketches incessantly in designing his building. Sketching for him is not simply a record of what he's imagined a moment before, but rather is a device for enhancing his imagining. He calls it a tool for thinking. And he's receptive to the unintended features of his drawings that may suggest further ideas. So when I asked what he was trying to do when he sketched, he replied, I'm trying to find the answers. I'm looking for the idea. It's hand-to-eye coordination, but it's also intuition. It has the training of the language that you've evolved. I purge the obvious stuff out during these drawings, then discard my obvious responses and go beyond. The process, drawing process, is just recording a prior act of imagination. So two of them purging out various obvious moves and then rethinking the design. He also said, when I start drawing sometimes, not knowing exactly where it is going, it's like feeling your way along in the dark, anticipating that something will come out usually. I become a voyeur of my own thoughts as I develop and wander about them. Again, he's exploring these possibilities to explore <coughs> So Gary's sketching process is an experimental procedure in an external medium in an attempt both to express a style but also to advance beyond its more familiar forms, to discover possibilities that otherwise might not have been detected <coughs> in pure imagination. And these sculptures sketches involve an interaction with numerous models, ranging from simple wooden block models, or models made of paper and cardboard, to more elaborate and finished items, including the plans produced by the computer program that this practice has developed as an interaction between these different levels of model and these um, uh, curious um, uh, creative imaginings. Now, scaffolding encompasses more than these intermediate and associated products of the creative process. It can involve the entire work environment, structuring it to trigger opportunistic assimilation or other factors promoting creativity. So Steve Jobs insisted that Pixar's headquarters at Emeryville be built around the central atrium, 
which contained a cafe, the mailboxes, and the only toilets in the building. His aim was to draw everyone into the area, and as Jobs put it, creativity comes from spontaneous meetings, from random discussions. He's trying to structure an environment to actually uh, generate these creative interactions. And indeed it worked. As John Lasseter remarked, I've never seen a building that promoted collaboration and creativity as well as this one. Now the situated view of creativity explains why these strategies and devices are successful in enhancing creativity. Still, one might think that the romantic theory, battered as it is, still applies to the realm of the great genius, an exception to the general rule of embedding for all mortals. Indeed, the Mozart letter is strong evidence for the romantic conception. Or rather, it would be, were it not for one said in fact, it's a forgery. The forger was the music journalist Friedrich Rocklitz, Rocklitz, who published the letter in 1815. Rocklitz was a keen supporter of the Romantic view and published a number of fake documents about composers' lives designed to support it. What we know about Mozart's musical practice is in fact radically different from that of the Rocklitz version, as the musicologist Ulrich Conrad has shown. Mozart, rather than completing entire compositions in his head, as a fake letter would have it, in fact found it very hard to compose without using a keyboard. He left about 150 surviving musical fragments, many of which were his failed attempts to write a passage that will fit, in, fit into the rest of the planned work, which is experimenting externally and discovering it didn't actually fit in. He also typically produced musical sketches in the course of composition to rough, rough out the idea, sometimes of a running theme in the work, sometimes more detailed ones of a single passage. And when Mozart talks in a genuine letter of 1780 of composing a work in his head, he means that he produced a rough outline in his head. The process of actually writing it to uh, its finished form which follows composition was not the transcription of an already completed work. Rather, it was working out the final form of the work, working out the complete details on paper. So Mozart this supports the romantic conception of creativity. But the study of Mozart the man suggests that it's a situated, embedded view. That's a correct one. Thank you. Thank you.